I wrote a book. Congrats. Thank you. So welcome to Home Movies, Sweet Enough Edition. Have you dined with us before? We do things a little differently here. Typically for Home Movies, we choose recipes based on seasonality, what's happening in my newsletter, what's happened in my other books that I've written. But this time, because we have the opportunity to kind of from scratch, sort of bring that book to life, bring it, you know, into the Home Movies universe a little bit more. Like the Marvel universe, but it's Home Movies and we don't get paid as much. And if you are wondering if this book is for you, if you say, what else? And I love your chicken recipes, but I don't bake. Well, this book is for you. And I say that because surely there will come a time in your life where you'll need to bake something, where there's a baby shower or a graduation or your friends are coming over or a birthday or whatever. And you're like, you know what? It'd be nice if I brought a little sweet something or if I had a little sweet something at the end. And to me, this book will give you those recipes that are foolproof, that are easy for the novice baker, that don't require any fancy equipment or any specialty ingredients that you can make in a regular kitchen with a regular oven and really have success and feel good about the thing that you've just made. Hey guys, what's up? We're in Manhattan, the big <laughs> New York, New York, and what better way to show you around my favorite city in the world than going to a restaurant supply store. So let's go. you don't need to go to a fancy specialty store. I often find the most success for both my savory and my sweet cooking, baking purposes to be in restaurant supply stores. And not only is it wonderful to just physically shop inside a store because you can see things that you forgot that you might want, be inspired by a new sort of piece of equipment or cake pan or anything, but it's nice to shop locally. It's nice to support small businesses. So when possible, I, I like to you know support that business uh, by giving them mine. I love all these things. These are cute. Do you need to buy anything right now? <sighs> Dan, I always need to buy something. <laughs> From mixing bowls, glass, and stainless steel, measuring cups, spoons, whisks, spatulas, it sort of runs the gamut. It's obviously catered to restaurants. They have things like really large hotel pans that won't fit in your oven, but they also have like really nice Pyrex measuring cups for not that much money. Like being in here does remind me of working in a restaurant though, because I remember like, We'd make little tiny loaf cakes in molds like this. Any loaf cake recipe that's in my book, of which I think there's at least three or four, can be made in a little mini loaf. We have stumbled upon the uh, cake aisle. I personally love to have an, a six and eight, uh, a six and eight and nine and a 10 spring form because I find spring forms to be the most versatile, useful cake pan in my whole arsenal. They're not airtight, so if your batter's a little loose, I've had some cake batters like spill out at the bottom, but that also has more to do with the fact that like if you put this in a dishwasher or you handle it roughly, they can bend. If you're not familiar, they're called a springform pan because they are spring-loaded and that means that the sides can come off and leave you with the base. So if you're the kind of person who gets concerned about how to unmold a cake or struggles with that ever, doesn't have parchment paper, a springform pan is for you. Okay, so Again, cake pans come in a wide variety of sizes, of heights, of dimensions. Unless you're baking cakes like professionally or for a wedding, I feel like you could get away with just having one cake pan, a nine inch or an eight inch to me are the best and most standard sizes. If you're a once a year cake baker, I would say like one standard nine or eight inch cake pan will do you just great. It's for cornbread so sweet the other sort of to me like most important baking vessel you could have aside from a cake pan is a tart pan i find the nonstick actually for a tart pan to be better because i like to bake cakes in these if you're just doing tarts your crust probably has enough butter where it's not going to really be sticking so it's not an issue much like a spring form pan um, part of the beauty of these things is that the bottom is separate from the sides unlike the spring form it doesn't actually get super super tight so this isn't great for super liquidy cake batters or anything like that, but there's plenty of cakes that I do recommend you baking in this because the sides get really nice and crispy. And this almost exclusively comes in like nine inch or 10 inch. So a nine inch removable tart pan is what I would recommend you purchase. I do like making tarts in a spring form though because I like the high sides. Good for quiche. I don't always call for a rolling pin because I actually think it's fine to use things like wine bottles if you have them on hand. Again, if you're like a once a year baker, I wouldn't recommend you investing in a rolling pin. That said, I would probably buy this one. 
It's small, it's manageable. This is great for like a big pie crust. You definitely do not need something like this unless you're opening a uh, croissant shop. You're not gonna open a croissant shop? I will not be pursuing croissant making at this time. <laughs> Thank you for respecting my privacy. <laughs> and there's a nacho cheese warmer, that's cool. Oh, here are the loaf pans. This is a one pound, nine inch by four inch loaf pan. It has a nonstick surface. It has really nice, beautiful, clean sides and edges. If you shop at like a regular sort of uh, kitcheny retail shop, the loaf pan they're gonna sell you is gonna have rounded edges. It's probably gonna be some wonky dimension like nine and three quarters by four and an eighth or something or even worse, nine by five, what? And while I'm pretty flexible with a lot of the equipment that I advise you use and seek out, when it comes to loaf pans, I really feel passionately about the sort of like restaurant quality, one pound, nine by four loaf pan. I love trays. I love bowls. I love trays and bowls. This is actually a great whisk. Great size, manageable. And I really like, you know, basic plain things like regular rolling pins, stainless steel whisks, sort of wooden spoons, this one's a little big. <laughs> what my preferences are might not be yours, but I do think that places like this are a good opportunity to see many different brands, styles, sizes in one place for you to make your own decisions. This jacket makes it look like I just killed a bunch of puppies. It's not fur, <laughs> just so you know, LOL. We laugh, but if you've ever had to like whisk something that's very hot and bubbling in a pan, this really comes in handy. I don't own this one myself, but this is um, the brand and style that on a bigger scale, no pun intended, the bigger version of this is what I would use in restaurants. Um, Taylor is a great brand. They make ones also for the home kitchen, which I think is the brand I have. I've had it for at least seven years and it's never died on me, not once. And I think that's it, Danny. I'm gonna buy this as well. Uh, I'm gonna put salt in it. <laughs> well, I need two types of salt. So you have the tools now, and then it's time to talk about ingredients, which most of the things you should probably already have in your pantry or your fridge. I wanted this book to be baked in a wide variety of kitchens. It's being published in many different countries. So it was really important to me that the things that I called for had like a very large swath of accessibility access points. Here's a hot take, maybe not that hot, I don't know. But unlike regular cooking where I feel like a really good chicken makes a big difference. Really good vegetables make a big difference. Seasonality is really important. This sort of spectrum of like, how much better can something be if you're using really expensive fancy butter or like really cheap basic butter. It's like not that big of a difference versus, you know, if you start with like a really bad, big out of season tomato versus like a beautiful in season, perfectly ripe heirloom tomato. Like the, that's a huge gulf that you're trying to cross. Cross a golf? The gap is too wide. Mine a gap. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done and you make the thing and you put it in the oven or you cook it on the stove top or you pop it in the fridge, it's gonna taste really good. So one thing I do mention in this book is that I am brand agnostic. I'm not draconian about it. I'm not like, you must have this or it won't turn out or it's the only way or whatever. There is one exception to that rule and the exception is my kosher salt. To me, the kosher salt is extremely important because each brand is very different in its size, its salinity, the way that it feels in your hand. One teaspoon of diamond crystal is not the same weight as a teaspoon of Morton's kosher, and it's certainly not the same weight as a teaspoon of fine sea salt. Also to that end, I know there are some of you that will always like increase the salt in a dessert recipe because you don't trust the person who wrote it. I am you, I do that. So I've already done that for you. So just trust me on this. The other salt that I'll use when I am baking is a flaky coarse salt. It's a finishing salt. It's really beautiful to put on top of cakes before they go into the oven. It's really beautiful to put on top of like a chocolate tart, which kind of sinks into the chocolate and sets really nicely like little crystals. It really can kind of elevate things and make them feel special without you having to do a whole lot of work. For this purpose, meaning this book, if you're gonna bake from it, all-purpose flour is the only one you will need. Never self-rising because you can't control the leavening. Never whole wheat because the flavor can sometimes dominate and the moisture is different. So I use King Arthur flour because I think it's a great brand. It's available across the country no matter where you go, no matter what store you're in, it's there. But I like to take it and I like to put it in a jar because I do the sort of scoop 
and level technique, a bag can sometimes feel messy to me. And, you know, folding up the bag and then putting on the thing, it's like, you get flour everywhere, I don't love it. This is David's fault. What do I level with my finger? Uh-huh. You could use an- Oh, God. I suck at this. Butter. Probably the thing that somebody would fight me on the most in that there are a lot of people of the mind that you should seek out the highest quality butter you can when baking. I also have been baking for so long that I have baked everything with every style and price range of butter. Cause I'm like basically saying you can also make like really great cake with butter, which is true. But I think there's a lot of professional bakers that'll be like, no, you should have the highest quality butter possible. That's like one ingredient people would like, I think like, eh, eh. Like, we're not making croissants here, like. I will not be pursuing croissant making at this time. Thank you for respecting my privacy. Also, like, use your judgment. I find that when I'm making things like shortbread, of course there are recipes for that in this book, I do like to use the nicer butter because that recipe is mostly butter. Oh, I think it goes without saying, unsalted butter. And this is just soft butter that you can have on the counter for, like, a scone, which there are two very good scone recipes in this book. I am an anti-scone person, but in this book I talk about it. Here's a really good cheesy scone. And this is a really good like berry scone, but you can put any fruit in, I call it a sweet enough scone. Okay. Guess David doesn't care. Moving on, sugar. When I say sugar, I mean granulated sugar. I mean regular Domino or CNH or whatever regional sugar brand you have access to. And then on hand just to like have, I like to have a mix of these other three to four sugars. Demerara sugar, I would say it's the most specialty ingredient. This is turbinado cane sugar. This is effectively the same thing. It will do the same thing as true Demerara sugar, which is here in this bag. True Demerara sugar is a little bit coarser, has a little bit more of a shine to it, but sugar in the raw is an acceptable and Honestly, probably the thing that I use more often than not. I don't bake with it so much because I use like a light brown or a dark brown sugar for like the interior of say a cake or a filling. It doesn't sink into the batter or the pie crust or the egg wash like granulated sugar. Brown sugar is not a substitute for it. It would just melt almost immediately. This is kind of the key to that gorgeous, like crunchy, craggly, crystally crust. And I can't live without it, frankly. It's like, to me, makes your baked goods 80% more beautiful and at least 50% more delicious. Brown sugar, my preference is light brown sugar that I pretty much never use dark brown sugar. That said, if you only had dark when calling for light, you can use it. It's not gonna make or break. And then last but not least, powdered sugar. Powdered sugar is sugar that is ground 10 times as fine as sugar, which is why it's called 10X. And it's blended with a little bit of cornstarch to uh, mitigate any sort of humidity or caking in the sugar also known as confectioner sugar. This is also, I guess, one thing where I would just really advise you to not use like an organic or off-brand powdered sugar. Use like a trusted sugar company sugar. They behave differently. If you mix a cup of powdered sugar from, that's like organic powdered sugar with an egg white, you'll get like a gray sludge. I'm not kidding. Okay. What's next? Eggs! The standard for me is a large egg, not extra large, not jumbo. The difference of weight is pretty great and will add way too much moisture, protein, or fat, depending on the egg. If you sort of, if you use like a jumbo or extra large egg, it just will. So the average egg inside weighs 50 grams. That's 30 grams for the white and 20 grams for the yolk. That's a little inside baseball. No one's gonna do that. <laughs> The number one dairy product I would recommend having on hand is buttermilk because this goes in so many things. It is tangy, it is tart. It gives you leavening in the form of like coupled with something like baking soda. It also gives you fat and tang and liquid with flavor. Like it is just to me a beautiful superstar ingredient. It also has the added benefit of like never really going bad. I don't work for the FDA. <laughs> But I can say that I've had buttermilk in my fridge for upwards of three months and I use it and it's fine. Buttermilk is low fat. It is the literal byproduct of taking all the fat and making butter with it and then everything that's left over. Milk, whole milk. It's a full fat cow's milk for me. There are some recipes in here where you can use things like oat and almond and macadamia, and, but by and large, I'm cooking with, baking with, testing with regular full fat cow's milk. Whipping cream. 
So heavy cream, heavy whipping cream are all sold and they are often sold next to each other. They will all whip. They will all become a pillowy soft peak to top your cakes and your pies and your puddings. There are a ton of other ingredients in this book that you might have to shop for. But if you have most of these things present, you're gonna be able to make most things in this book. Next time you're at the store, if you're like, I don't know if I have any brown sugar, pick up a box, it'll cost you like $3. And the next time you open this book and you're like, oh, I have everything I need to make this cake. Won't you feel smug? We've talked about ingredients, we've talked about tools, we've talked about equipment, and the recipe for this is sort of like the gateway recipe, which is crushed raspberries and sour cream. Sometimes all you need is a bowl and a fork. You could use a strawberry, a blackberry, a raspberry. I like raspberries because they have the highest amount of acidity, they're juicy, you can add sugar to them without them becoming too cloyingly sweet, and truly, you simply can't beat the color. They're also pretty good all year round. So, little bowl of berries, Sprinkle with some sugar. Anytime you add sugar to a fruit, or vegetable for that matter, much like salt, it's gonna draw out the liquid. So I crushed them just kind of lightly. You can see like, there's still some whole pieces of raspberry in there. But I crushed it enough to kind of like release, start releasing some juices. You can always add like a splash of lemon juice, of lime juice, of orange juice, tangerine juice. You could gussy this up however you want. If you're like, I've got some lemon thyme or I don't know, little rose water or something like that. There are things that you can add to this fruit to kind of make it even a little bit more special. So you can assemble this dessert in pretty much anything you have. I have like a random assortment of cute glasses, some which match, some which don't, but I'm just sort of showing you that you could put it in a wine glass, you could put it in like a martini-ish cocktail glass. I bought these at a garage sale for like $4 and I love them. How long are you waiting for that dessert? Two to four minutes. I didn't add any liquid to this. This is just the natural sort of whatever. And this is a good trick and technique to do anytime you're serving fresh fruit with a cake or a pudding or anything. And maybe they're not quite ripe enough, they're not juicy enough, they're not giving you like the visual like lusciousness you so crave. Sprinkle with a little sugar, crush with a fork, and they'll just sort of like bathe themselves in their own juice without you having to cook them at all. Again, with all uh, dairy products, yogurt, sour cream, you wanna give it a stir before you use it. And this is just like a little layering dessert. So each layer shouldn't be too thick. And again, because these have sugar in them, I don't feel the need to sweeten the sour cream at all. I, to me, it's like the juxtaposition of like purely tart, rich, sort of fatty sour cream and this like sweetened, acidic, like crushed seedy berry. This is like a dessert snack, by the way. But I find often at the end of a meal, it's sort of the only thing I have really the energy for or the desire to eat. If you wanted, you could absolutely layer in some sort of crushed cookie or crumbled something. And depending on the vessel that you're using, this can take like a few layers. This is just sour cream, raspberry, sour cream, raspberries. There's no like measurements. I just kind of faked it. Mm. It's so good. I love it so much. And it really does taste like special. And it's not too sweet. It has a lot of texture. It's creamy. And you did like literally zero work. And so there's like a something with like sweet ice cream and unsweetened berries, but we're sort of flipping the script and it's like sweetened fruit with unsweetened cream is just like fantastic. It's just kind of a reminder like, oh, this can still be really special. This can still feel remarkable and like hopefully encourage you like, oh, I actually do like a little sweet treat at the end of the meal. Consider this to be like a gateway and just like a pleasant reminder. And if this is as far as you go, bless you. That's great. I hope that you love the berries and sour cream, but hopefully it encourages you to uh, go a little deeper into this book. Look how upset this guy looks. He's like, what have I done? He's like, this is a terrible lifestyle.